As I'm listening to the song, I'm thinking of the words of Paul to the Philippians. Let us lay hold of that for which he has laid hold of us. Probably my favorite scripture. Let us pray. Lord, my grip may loosen on you, but your grip does not loosen on me. And I'm thanking you, Lord, today that our salvation was initiated, provided for, experienced through the divine goodness, the heart that has always beat only with love to save us from ourselves and from those who have hated us, from your enemy in heaven who came here to make us your enemies. But when we are your enemies, you died for us so that we could be sons and daughters of God. Now bless us as we open the word. May we be genuine Christians. And may it be impossible for the world not to see the exalted, beautiful path of life that you mark out. Please do that in us and through us, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I'm titled the message this morning, Heresy, Blasphemy, Treachery, and Identity. Writing in Third Selected Messages, the author would state that which we have most to fear is nominal Christianity. The problem is, and it's rampant in our church, is that we have so long practiced a consumer model of church lest people should walk away with their shoe leather and their wallets lest we should be decried as not loving the young people or not loving the marginalized or whatever it might be for so long we practice a consumer model of church not a family model a healthy family model that we've found ourselves robbed of the encouragement, the affirmation, and the messaging that there is victory in Christ. But find that victory. You can't just piecemeal what you want from God. He calls you to a full surrender. (laughs) Because sin in your life in another arena will short-circuit the power you need in the area you'd like some help in. That rich young ruler that came to Jesus... He could have just left the greed and the covetousness alone, but he didn't. He said, if you want what I have to offer, this is what's holding you back. I'd like to have you, but you'll need to release this so that the love that's in your heart for me can flow freely and my love can flow through you and the transformation can be complete. The majority of nominal Christians, while they profess to be living for Christ, are really living for the world, she states. They do not discern the excellence of heavenly things and therefore cannot truly love them. Many profess to be Christians because Christianity is considered honorable. They do not discern that genuine Christianity means cross-bearing. It's what sets you free, but it's also how you die to self. And their religion has little influence to restrain them from taking part in worldly pleasures. Dr. Neil Nedley stood in this pulpit this week for the pastors, teachers, and elders, and he revealed a medical diagnosis that our society is rampant in self-pleasure, including self-abuse. Consequentially, There's so little actual motivation to do anything that was considered ordinary for the eons that make up human history. The Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? A new creation. Any man. Old things have what? Passed away. And then make sure you don't miss this next word. Behold. How much? All things become new. Last night, probably prompted by God, I had someone come talk to me after this service, which was very good. It was a 
sermon by Pastor Bryce Bowman. If you didn't get to watch it, it'd be a good Sabbath afternoon experience after you do something to break up all the sitting, of course. This is what the lady told me. Two little four-year-olds in a daycare. She watched it. She heard it. And this is what they're saying to each other. No, you can't. Yes, I can. Little girl saying, no, you can't. And a little boy saying, yes, I can. Four times it goes back and forth. And then finally the boy is tired of it. And he says, yes, I can grow up and marry another boy. My mommy said so. And this is a very educated mother, but not a very wise one. During our pastor, teachers, and elders conference, Michael Carducci was our keynote speaker to start us off. And in the beginning of his presentation, he told us about a week of prayer for kids that he does. It's programming to help kids develop a healthy identity that's aligned with their God-given created identity. He said, I say to all the little boys, okay, little boys, it's your turn. Stand up. And they all stand up. And then to all the little girls, okay, it's time for you little girls to stand up. And they all stand up. He said the kindergartners get it. He said it takes a PhD to mess it up. I think I would say to all of you who have especially young children, it's probably a good time to make sure that you know who's raising them. And if there's a way to do it yourself, go ahead. In that day, the Lord Almighty will be a glorious crown, Isaiah 28, a beautiful wreath for the remnant of his people. He will be a spirit of justice to the ones who sit in judgment and a source of strength who turn back the battle at the gate. That is where we are. Jesus said the gates of hell won't be able to stand up against you. It turns out instead that in our consumer grade of religion where there can be no prophetic authority, where moms and dads don't do their parental role and elders and deacons don't stand up in a beautiful way, of course, always in a Christ-centered way, and and decide to announce and protect and provide for the the lines, the boundaries that constitute health from unhealth, function from dysfunction. Yes, we're living in a very interesting age. Heresy. Heresy. Heresy, adherence to a religious opinion contrary to a church dogma. If you want to read a little bit farther, they'll say it's an alternate to the expert or common view. I want to tell you, I'm going to bring up at least six heresies very quickly here that you need to have written on the front of your mind. You you might want to write them in the front of your Bible, but we're living in an age where there is an absolute all-out onslaught into the lives of your children's mind and some of yours, obviously, based on the four-year-old argument. Heresy number one. You do not have to be an expert to understand the clear and simple statements of the Bible. This is a fact, it's true. The heresy is that you do have to be an expert, that there is an alternative view. Christian Education, page 57. The Bible was not written for the scholar alone. On the contrary, it was designed for the common people. The great truths necessary for salvation are made as clear as noonday. We're just a few minutes past it right now. And none will mistake and lose their way except those who follow their own in judgment instead of the plainly revealed will of God. God. Patriarchs and prophets commenting on the origin of the species says, here is clearly set forth, that is the creation account, the origin of the human race, and the divine record is so plainly stated that there is no occasion for erroneous conclusions. Fill in the blanks. I'll prompt you. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, 12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged what? Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrows, and it is a discerner of the thoughts in the intents of the heart. Another version says, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than. Is it really possible 
that the Bible, which was written at the great expense of people's blood, exile, loss of property, that this book should be printed in the common language at such great extent and expense, and we should come to the the final ages of earth's history in which we flout so-called science and expertiseism, and now the ordinary person has no confidence, no, no stiffness in their backbone to actually stand up and say, it is written. What we have going on is a capitulation to so-called science, and we're willing to remake our theology in order to fit the latest science. What we instead have going on is that people are bowing down to make sure they don't sacrifice their own emotional needs, parents and caregivers, instead of challenging the child or the spouse or the friend to discover something more than the nominal religion that birthed the deviancy, the perversion, the confusion, instead of challenging them to go deeper, we are capitulating to our own emotional needs where we can't bear the price of separation. But I want to tell you, if you don't listen to any testimony from this last week, make sure you listen to Monday night with Tony and Judah Davis that we flew in from Great Britain who actually got their daughter back because they refused to abandon their allegiance to God and eventually she had an epiphany and she was baptized and is walking with God and is a student at Weimar University today in this all happened in the last few years. Heresy number two, this kind can't change. The Bible says, therefore he is also able to save them to the what? Uttermost. I just wonder what uttermost means. Or do I need a deviant definition to take out and carve out certain dynamics of the human experience to those who come to God through him since he is always living to make intercession for them for us can you imagine right now God pushes the pause button on the expansion of the universe while his own character is up for scrutiny and he focuses all his attention on those that will live to liberate his conscience from the lies, not his conscience, but the questions of the world, the, the, the rest of the world's drunkards, perjurers, philanders, carousers, abusers, murderers, slanders. Is sexual expression the holy grail of human existence? Is it tantamount to life itself? Or is it a powerful human dynamic that's easy to hijack and leverage for the destruction of man? Does it need a special place in the pantheon of sins? Has the eternal, infinite God met his match in the expression of this depravity of man? Is the idea that we are forever to retain our identity by our temptation? Is it not a denial of the very presence and power of the living Christ who not only spoke the world into existence, but he makes us over again? We call it the new creation in Christ. Heresy number three. You are a complete and catastrophic function of chance. Consequentially, your choices, your life, they're all your own. Go ahead and enjoy. It's what the Bible says. You've searched me and you know me. You know me when I sit down and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. And David didn't understand the genome. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in behind and before you lay your hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far sides of the sea, even there your hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. Sounds like something we just heard in song. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day for darkness is his light to you. You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful and I know that fare well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body and all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. 
When I awake, I am still with you. Heresy number four. Your life is your life. You are your own. Express yourself however you want. Be whoever you want. This is what the Bible says. Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, you are to honor God with your bodies and their expressions, including the private side. If there's one thing that became clear to me this week, as I listened to two different families testify about their deliverance from sin, that tied to this ideology, tied to this concept, are demonic forces. It's not just another idea. It's not just a broad spectrum of options. No, this is a darkness designed at the very end to hijack a physical appetite for connection and intimacy. And all throughout history, pagan idol worship has hijacked it to keep its adherents bound to false systems of thinking, doing, being, and worshiping. And nothing's different now. We still have churches on, most, on many street corners. But the real fact of the matter is, is that the real church needs to be in your mind and in your home. And you can't carry around these devices that allow the hijacking of your children's ways of thinking. They can't be put in the pressure cooker. They can't have the orthodontic pressure of sexual perversion wrapped around their minds and their thoughts and put in their faces all the time without affecting them. Their life is not their own. And there may need to be a change in your home. There may be a new admission of the soon return of Christ and His legitimate call upon your time, talent, resources, prayer, focus, schedule, and gatherings. Number five, you can choose or you can change your gender. This is what God's Word says. Genesis 1.27, God made man in His own image. In the image of God created him, what? Male and female. Genesis 5.12, as if we need to get the point across, you might think the Bible authors, led by the Holy Spirit, might have seen what was coming somewhere. Genesis 5.12, male and female created them and blessed them and called them Adam. Matthew 19.4, in case we want to relegate the Old Testament to some kind of Israelite hagiography or or other contortion of narrative development. It says, Jesus speaking, he answered and he said to them, didn't you read it? That which he did in the beginning when he made them male and female. And here's the thought I haven't heard anybody bring up lately. Isaiah 45, 9 to 11. Woe to those who quarrel with their maker. Those who are nothing but potsherds among the potsherds of the ground. Does the clay say to the potter, what are you making? Do you say to the one to the potter that the potter has no hands woe to the one who says to a father what have you begotten or to a mother what have you brought forth in birth this is what the Lord says the Holy One of Israel is your maker and do you question me about my children or give me orders about the work of my hands every cell of your body is imprinted with the Creator's identity, a biblical identity. And is it any wonder when we try to bury it, obscure it, cancel it, put it in front of everybody's faces, give no option for dialogue about anything else? Is it any wonder that we should have a mental health crisis where we're putting the wrong things in the gas tank and expecting the engine to churn out vigor and power on emotional, mental, and relational lines, especially in our youth? And then you have all those out there who supposedly given their lives to science, but they are the first to demonize any other point of view. And just remember what the poster on the foyer says. If you can talk about it, it's science. If you can't talk about it, it's propaganda. Number six. I'll combine six and seven, the heresies. You can't return to your God-given identity and your case is hopeless. 
I want you to remember there's a prodigal in the pig pen. And I want you to start thinking about all the stories in the Bible where there's a sexual connection. This one had it. He had squandered his wealth with prostitutes. Could it be possible that like the dogs that had moved in? Terrible term for sodomites. But is it possible that that might have only been prostitutes of one gender we don't know the story doesn't say but he surely gets down into the muck and mud of it but the Bible says when he came to himself when his pride was conquered by his misery the sad thing is there are parents pastors teachers administrators who are standing aside for pride to run the lives through the meat grinder sometimes almost physically 22 states have man-made laws that you cannot give any kind of counsel if you're a professional counselor to help a person discover anything that would align with their biological God-given gender. You know what I think? I think the devil is afraid because he doesn't want anybody walking around out there giving testimonies that you know what? It can, it does, and it will happen if you give the power of Christ and the indwelling Christ the ability to live in your life. Satan doesn't appear to be too afraid of churches, but it appears he must be afraid of Christian counselors, and I consider that very pathetic. Now let's go on to blasphemy. Blasphemy is the act of insulting or showing contempt or lack of reverence for God. It can also be the act of claiming attributes of a deity. I want you to know something. Nothing I'm about to say applies to anybody in the LGBTQ arena. I thought carefully before I use this word. Nothing I'm about to say applies in my mind at this moment to at least anybody I would know in the LGBTQ arena. I'm going to use the word blasphemy specifically for people who are members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, I want to reiterate something that Danny Shelton said from this pulpit. Only I'm going to come at it a little bit different. I'm here to tell you something. The Sabbath matters. Could I get an amen? Amen. The Sabbath matters. But you know what the real apex of creation was? It was mankind. And the Sabbath was created so God and man could be together and man wouldn't forget. But the apex of creation was man and woman. This is what God looked at and said, it's very good. The Sabbath did not even exist as a, as a, the Sabbath was celebrated the first time without divine direction. I'm not saying God wasn't there. No, God was there giving them a Sabbath experience. But if you care to read Patriarchs and Prophets and look at it carefully, what you're going to see is that the Sabbath was given after it was experienced by humankind as an opportunity to look at the glory of the Creator God and to be with the Creator God. It it was holy time carved out, but the real apex of creation made in His image can't be fulfilled in a 24-hour period of time. Made in His image has to be made by somebody who's living, breathing, living, dwelling, thinking, doing And the destruction of that image is what we're dealing with as a society now. And is this political speech? No. This is moral speech, which may end up affecting political discourse. It certainly should, because the church is called to be salt and light. Otherwise, we could watch our whole society implode in the mindlessness of self-abuse and lack of self-control. Four groups of people. Four groups of people. All of them Seventh-day Adventists. Number one, it is blasphemous for doctors who take the name Seventh-day Adventists and supposedly preach the three angels' messages which says, worship him who made, we're right back in Genesis right away, to actually suggest, recommend, or perform actions or activities that reconstruct the way that people think about their gender and their sexual identity or physically remove body parts and add others in. This, my friends, is blasphemy. My real number one, though, is pastors and counselors who in the name of grace 
deny the power of redeeming, sustaining, victory-giving, Christ-dwelling, spirit-imparted grace to either, as Daniel Varela had on the screen last night, know that some people may not actually be able to live and express their natural sexual expression. They might choose to live as eunuchs. But this being told, those pastors who step aside and then even go worse than that and affirm what will end up being a life of perpetual Babylonian thinking, confusion, these men and sometimes women who want to affirm people in their sin, whether it be just one or two or a regular pantheon of them, these members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in doing it are committing blasphemy. Number three, hospital administrators who prostitute the message, the principles, and the essence of who we are in order to stay in business. If you're a Seventh-day Adventist and you know what the law of God says and you believe in the biblical narrative of creation and you know Jesus reiterated it saying he made them male and female, if in the name of a supposed belief in the three angels' messages and the soon return of Christ, you're willing to portray in the culture of your institutions affirmation for this confusion this sin-destroying, body-destroying, soul-destroying confusion, this, my friends, is blasphemy. And the last group, church administrators who remain silent as wolves ravage the fold. It is hypocrisy, as has happened in our denomination recently, that ordained ministers are put on a do not speak list who hold credentials with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But deviant and soul-destroying philosophies can be shared at Adventist universities and no protest from administration is elicited. This is blasphemy. And we are beyond the days of suggesting that loyalty to the church is to give everybody time to just fix it behind the scenes. I'm sorry, after 30 plus years of being a pastor, it's time for the body politic, and I don't mean with political methods, but it's time for the corpus of the church. Remember what they said about Jesus? The ordinary people heard him what? Gladly. It's time for the church to be able to say, if you can't, as Leah Iacocca used to say, lead, follow, or get out of the way, because we are living in an age where all that's at stake is our children. Great controversy. Were it not that the world is hopelessly intoxicated with the wine of Babylon, multitudes would be convicted and converted by the plain cutting truths of God's word, sharper than any two-edged sword, alive. But religious of faith appears to be so confused and discordant that the people do not know what to believe is truth. The sin of the world's impenitence lies at the door of the church. And in every generation, she writes on page 606, God has sent his servants to rebuke sin, both in the world and in the blank. Fill in the blank. The church. If we somehow have a tacit subscription to the idea of the infallibility of the institution, then we have wandered into more Babylonian thinking that I would care to give affirmation to. But the people desire smooth things spoken to them, and the pure, unvarnished truth is not acceptable. Many reformers, in entering upon their work, determined to exercise great prudence in attacking the sins of the church and the nation. They hope by the example of a pure Christian life to lead people back to the doctrines of the Bible. But the Spirit of God came upon them as it came upon Elijah, moving him to rebuke the sins of a wicked king and an apostate people. They could not refrain from preaching the plain utterances of the Bible, doctrines which they had been reluctant to present. They were impelled to zealously declare the truth and the danger which threatened souls. The word of God, which the Lord gave them, they uttered, fearless of consequences, and the people were compelled to hear the warning. I'm here to tell you in not too many weeks at one of our university churches there will be a celebration of homosexuality and as I click through some of the Facebook pages 
I came upon one. If I would have had time to put this in a PowerPoint, I could have showed it to you. I would think I was looking at some demonic force from ancient paganism. Treachery. The definition of treachery is a violation of allegiance or faith and confidence. It is an act of treason. You know what? <laughs> Once I had kids, <laughs> my wife and I, every single decision we made after that was thinking about our fiduciary. That means our inherent responsibility that we had taken on when we had them. I have four and a fifth that I've adopted in the name of the Lord. I didn't go to big churches in big cities because I believe my children need simple lives. When we had events at the church, we didn't leave the family behind. We brought them along. We did things together. We made it a, a journey. My children's vocabulary, my children's network of people that they know, it all grew because I showed them that when you seek first the kingdom of God, he adds every other thing with it. They're gifted, successful adults. They have enough strength to stand up for what they believe. Not all of them are living by the belief system I gave them. But that's all right. Like Dobson said, I'm not taking all the credit for the good and I'm not taking all the blame for the bad. There's got to be a few more experienced parents here. My allegiance is to Christ. And it supersedes my allegiance to them. And when they became young adults and they could challenge my value system, the one that I had poured my life, my prayers, my money, my efforts, everything in, I stood true for what I believed, Amen. thus giving them the chance to know there's a rock to come back to and there's somebody solid in their life who's going to be principled and real. I feel sorry for the parents who get all pretzelized and tied up in knots because they can't bear the idea that their child would reject them over their allegiance to God and his value system. If you listen to the Davis' testimony, one thing was absolutely clear. Nothing broke their heart like their daughter's pronouncement that she was going into a dark identity moment in her life. But they did not quit loving her, and they did not quit loving Jesus, and they knew where their first allegiance had to be. And when you watch the video of the baptism here on Monday night, you had to be rejoicing, probably with tears in your eyes if you've made this parenting gamut. Treachery is when I violate my allegiance of protecting somebody. Pastors, you cannot fail to teach your people how to love everybody. Love this community. And by the way, by the time somebody that's been in this community shows up at church, you need to remember something. The Holy Spirit's been working on their heart because walking through these doors is probably one of the scariest things they've ever done. Watch Taisha Holt's testimony on Tuesday night. They live their lives such full of rejection, let alone the Holy Spirit speaking to them all the time. We must be the most loving and beautiful people. Nobody that walks through this door who doesn't look like maybe what we think they should look like should receive anything except the beauty of Christ that might continue the journey of wooing them back. You don't show up at churches anymore unless the Holy Spirit's been showing up with you a long time ahead of time. <laughs> Lastly, identity. It's the distinguishing character or personality of an individual. You know what? If you don't know that Jesus would have died just for you, if you don't know, he can read your mind. If you don't know, he knows what you're going to say before you say it. If you don't know, he knows the number of hairs on your head. If you don't know, he doesn't know that he knows how many times your heart's going to beat and how many inhalations and exhalations. If you don't know that he's got a plan for your marriage, if you don't know, he can help you overcome your, your proclivities, your tendencies inherited or cultivated to sin. If you don't know any of that stuff, probably it shouldn't surprise us that a world full of nominal churches should reap a harvest of confused, desperate people looking for some kind of 
deliverance from the heaviness of a society that appears to be at the end of its rope. I mean, you can't turn the news on without seeing that nobody can talk to each other and the world is unraveling, even the physical environment. I mean, who could be surprised? But isn't it just a great time for us to let the world know that Jesus would have come here and died on a cross just for you and all love you with some of the same love that he has for you so you can experience it in flesh and blood? Some people know how to snatch defeat out of the jaws of victory. I'm here to tell you, friends, when God told Jeremiah, before you were born, I knew you. I want you to think about something. When David would write in Psalm 139, your thoughts are more than the sand of the sea, I want you to ask yourself this question. How many times throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity that predate your birth did God think about you? Somebody ought to walk around this afternoon in numbed silence that before you appeared on the scene, God had mulled you over in his mind time and time again and talked about you with the angels. How many of you have read the book Swift Arrow? Everybody should read it. But you know, for Swift Arrow to go from being a boy to a man, he had to run the gauntlet. They lined up two rows of warriors, just barely a little more than shoulder width apart. The warriors faced each other, and in the right hand of the opposing warriors, they all had a knife. And to the rhythmic beat of a drum, all of the would-be warriors had to run through this gauntlet, and here came the knife, boom. Boom, boom. The goal of Swift Arrow was to make it from the start to the finish. And he practiced for days running as fast as he could without his shoulders swaying. And before he got to his place in the line, he could see the bleeding bodies of warriors who hadn't made it. Parents, Do you want your kids running the gauntlet or should you run it for them? Perhaps they're not ready yet. Perhaps they shouldn't have a noose or a poisonous puff adder put in their hands in the form of a smartphone. Perhaps they should have those phones that exceptionally limit them except to get in touch with you, which is how every teenager leverages their way into getting something that's bad for them. Don't worry about your reputation. Worry about your responsibility. I want to tell you, there were people here this week listening to me, some of them in the education profession, some parents whose kids have gone into our universities and come out twisted. That's because there are clubs on our university campus that affirm identity confusion, but very few that affirm identity in Christ. Praise the Lord for these names. See if you can figure out what they have in common. Daisy, Taisha, Genevieve, Daniel, Harrison, Jerry, Wayne, Ron, Michael, Rihanna, Lisa, Tony, Patty, and the list could go on. What do they have in common? They're here on our premises sharing their testimony. And since you can overcome this confusion by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, we ought to be rejoicing that we can have them here in our midst as a prime evidence that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things can pass away, have passed away, will pass away. Behold, all things have become new. Amen.